Welcome. Fancy. Доброго дня. My name is Larissa Hedek. I'm the director of the Ukrainian Resource and Development Center at McKeon University. I'm here today with my friend and colleague, Marina Chernyavska from the Cool Folklore Center at the University of Alberta. Today's discussion is the continuation of the Indigenous Ukrainian Relationship Building Initiative, a joint project of the Cool Folklore Center and the Ukrainian Resource and Development Center. I am honored to be part of a small group of mighty women who are passionate about giving a life to this initiative. Today is the first in the series of events focusing on the topic of land. We are looking forward to deep conversations that will probably make us uncomfortable, unsettled spaces, but with open minds will help us all move into the future together and build meaningful relationships. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather in Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place for many indigenous people. We honor and respect the history, languages, ceremonies, and culture of the First Nations, Mati, and Inuit who call this territory home. The First People's connection to the land teaches us about our inherent responsibility to protect and respect Mother Earth. With this acknowledgement, we honor the ancestors and children who have been buried here missing and murdered indigenous women and men, and the process of ongoing collective healing for all human beings. We are reminded that we are all treated people and of the responsibility we have to one another. We encourage you today to approach this conversation with kindness, compassion, open mind, and dignity. And now I'm turning over Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like before we start, I would like to share um, two updates with you. First of all, I would like to let you know that we now have a website for this initiative. It's uh, located at uh, storiesoftheselands.ca. It's quite easy to remember. Uh, I will share my screen and show you quickly. Uh, this is our website. Uh, you can find all our past and upcoming events on it. And I would specifically uh, like to focus on our logo. Um, we are uh, happy to uh, share this uh, art that was created by, um, by an artist, Sharon Rose uh, Kutney, also known as Sharon Chervenyuk. Uh, she's an artist of uh, indigenous and Ukrainian background, and I would like to share with you um, an excerpt from uh, the process, uh, as she described, of creating this logo. As a beadworker of botanical design, my daily inspiration begins with a walk through the bush or time spent in the garden. Being amongst nature is essential to my practice helping to create a sense of peace and well-being and the occasion to explore and examine. With both indigenous and Ukrainian ancestry, the prospect of creating a logo for the indigenous Ukrainian relationship building initiative was an opportunity to visually articulate the deep love and gratitude I feel towards the women of my extended family, both past and present and the seasons we collectively experience. Like the abundant wild roses that grew on Flora's river lot along the Peace River, and the tiny poppy seeds Donka brought along on her epic journey from Bukovina to the new country, the flowers of the logo represent fortitude, hope, and faith, and the cycles and passages of their lives. The berries signify the commonalities of my grandmothers, their kindness and generosity of spirit, and their steadfast perseverance achieved with an open and welcoming heart. Uh, we are extremely grateful to Sharon, and I hope she's here with us in the audience, and also to uh, her partner, artist Jason Sivington, who helped to uh, bring this logo into a digital world. 
I encourage all of you to uh, explore our website, read about our initiative, and uh, join us for future events. And with this, I will pass it over to Chelsea. Anse kakyo, Chelsea Val Nitsigason. My name is Chelsea Val Eguamantu Sakaeganek Otsinia. I'm from Lac Saint Anne, just just west of Edmonton. I'm living here in Emiskuchi Wiskaeganek Anots. So I'm right here in Edmonton. Uh, if you're joining us from all over the place, that's great. And it's pretty exciting to have uh, these events going on. So uh, I am Métis, I'm Opem Suosquel, uh, but my paternal grandmother was Ukrainian and I don't really have much knowledge about, uh, about her or about uh, my father's Ukrainian roots or anything. So being part of this initiative has been a bit of an autoethnography for myself as well. Uh, so welcome to this event. Uh, we have it. We have this in three different languages. We've got some Cree, we've got some Ukrainian, and then the English translation. So this event is Kayas Udalekomo Minulumo, uh, long ago on our lands. So we're starting off a series of, uh, of of talks. This is our first one out of three, and this one is focusing on the time before Ukrainian settlers came and um, before colonialism really altered land-based practices. Our next event, uh, which is gonna be October 20th, is talking a little bit more about uh, more recent history and uh, contemporary realities for us. And then, because it's not just enough to look at history, our uh, third event is gonna be November 17th, and we're gonna talk about the future. So we're taking, we're sort of building this process. We're talking about the past, we're talking about the present, and then we're trying to build a better future. That's the purpose of all of this. So joining us today, we have four uh, amazing panelists who are going to speak to you uh, from their from their uh, expertises. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of gathered uh, knowledge here today, and I'm going to get each one of them to introduce themselves to you rather than read out a long bio. I think it's more interesting to actually see the person and hear what they have to share about themselves. So I'm going to start, please, with uh, Kete Aya Elder Francis Whiskey Jack. Uh, if you could please introduce yourself, Elder. Hi, hi, Chelsea. Kawietiko Kisi Kweo Nitsika Sun. My ceremonial name is Fine Day. Nia Nehio Nitskopu Nehote. I am Cree from Sad Lake First Nations. And I'm very honored, of course, to be here today. My, I'm known, uh, my Christian name is, of course, uh, Dr. and Elder Francis Huskajak, as I'm known to the universities. But I wanted to uh, acknowledge and thank uh, Myrna and uh, Larissa for the protocol of the tobacco protocol and uh, this uh, prayer cloth that they offered. And uh, what I wanted to do to begin this uh, meeting is to uh, do a virtual uh, cleansing, spiritual cleansing uh, for you all. The medicines that actually come from Mother Earth and that I have with me, because this is a part of a daily activity for me every day, and to acknowledge the preciousness of life. So we use everything that is natural, and you see this fire. And we acknowledge the sun as it shares its warmth from the sacred fire every day. And we, it radiates within us so that we may share our light with others. And I purposely speak in my second language, which is English, so that you may understand me and save some time. But I'm burning the sage, sweet pine, cedar, sweet grass, and as you see the smoke from this little pan. And I use this beaded eagle feather. And I'm gonna honor the four directions and the teachings of four, our spirituality, our physicality, our mentality and our emotions, especially in the time when COVID is here and the findings of all these graves in our history, during our happy times and also our grieving times. So with all the participants listening in here today, put your faith and belief that our prayers will go to the creator and those that we know as we sick walk at the Yukonak, the grandfathers, the grandmothers, the spirit guides, will bring all our sharing to the heavens that we know, spirit world. And we have lost a lot of our elders to COVID and maybe a lot of your own loved ones. 
but this is the journey that we walk and the reality of life. So with that, I also wanted to begin by sharing one of the drums that I have painted because of the buffalo that was our economy and the white buffalo of the north, the wisdom keepers. So I wanted to say that this drum is the heartbeat of our nations. Every nation has a drum of some kind or an instrument that they can identify with. And this drum, when we listen to it in round dance, the gathering circles, the meeting of new friends or the renewing of old friendships. And when you hear this drum, it's like this, like the heartbeat. So we hold hands in unity and that's the power of unity, the circle of life. So I wanted to share this song and, and, and starting this off today as a prayer song. And it's usually sung before every uh, round dance. The message in the song in Cree says, life is so short. The creator had said that life is so short. We never know when we go back to the spirit world. But in connecting, we should always be kind and love one another. That's the gist of the song, for life is that fragile and life is so short. And so with the elements of the fire, Mother Earth, water, and the sacred wind. So I, I just wanted to give you an example of how powerful that song is and how it binds us together. And uh, being a residential school survivor, I know a little bit of history, but I don't profess to know everything. But I, with what I know, I know that language is an integral part of where I come from, my identity, and also to be proud of who I am and to know our ceremonies, the dances, the regalia, because we have so many things similar to uh, the Ukrainian nation. And uh, so I just wanted to thank you and start you off in a positive way. Hi, hi, nanasko man kakyo no Hi, hi, Mr. Hay, thank you so much. Uh, the next person that I'd like to introduce themselves is uh, Uga Magan, Chief Greg Desjardins. So if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Aunista, I see me na naskum ao gutaw ino, kana naskum ao to win skawanuts. I see me na tam skat now. I say first and foremost, I'm thankful to the Creator for allowing us to get up today. I shake hands with each and every one of you. Chief Greg Desjolais, Frog Lake First Nation. I just wanna say greetings from Treaty 6 area. It's an honor for me to come and to share some wisdom, some knowledge. 
Nista, I learn every day. I'm grateful for the protocol as well. I got it today. And it's, it's one of my colors. It represents the Thunderbirds. Pisuino is Higasun. Thunderbird Bean is also my Cree name. I was named in a Sundance ceremony by an elder who has gone on to the spirit world. I have uh, three beautiful children, two adult children, two sons, and one daughter. And I have uh, four grandchildren. And uh, I serve three terms of, of council. And in my, currently in my second year as the chief of the Frog Lake First Nation. You know, I too, I use spirituality to create a balance in my life, harmony, you know, where I could, you know, do my job and uphold my position as the chief. You know, because sometimes we have to wear many hats. So when I, when I leave, each day is a mystery. You know, I go to work not knowing what lies ahead, not knowing what each, each of the members is going through, but I try my best to problem solve. You know, but I'm, I'm just here merely a pitiful human being, but I'm here to share and I ask questions to us. You know, we lived off the land. Our ancestors, like our elder Francis shared, the buffalo was the, our, our economy. We used every part of that animal for food, for clothing, for tools, for shelter. You know, our, our people are very resilient, beautiful, First Nations people, our men and our women and our children. You know, we, we've been through so much to today, but we must coexist on this land we call Turtle Island. I wanna thank the elder for starting us off in a beautiful way because me too, I have my smudge going here today at my home. You know, because like what we share here today, it might offend some people, but we must speak truth. We must be open and honest to each other here. I wanna thank my, my moderator, my friends who invited me to come and share. Nista, I'm just a young, a young man in my infancy trying to learn these ways that our ancestors have passed on. Nehiu Mistiguin, the native way that used to be banned when we couldn't even leave the reserve, we needed a permit. We have evolved to a place now. We are now business people, lawyers and doctors. So with that, I just wanted to share that much. And I thank you for all coming, all the guests who are on. I shake hands with all of you. I greet you in the creator's name from my heart to yours, because that's who we have to be as human beings. That's what the creator wants is for us to love, respect, and care for one another. Same in that I'm Scott now. With that, I shake hands with each and every one of you. Hi, hi, Chief. Very well done. Thank you. Um, Okay, so next person to introduce here, we have Punat Toskeo Kistunwama Gale. So that's a Cree for, that's my Cree translation of Professor Emeritus, uh, John Paul Himka. Yes, I, I am a Professor Emeritus. I wanna, I wanna first of all also uh, thank the organizers. I, I also received a gift which in Ukraine is known by the technical name of, as Plashko uh, Horyvke. And I would I'd like to say how much I really am honored to be on this panel and to meet uh, uh, the Chief and the Elder and Matt. Um, we've had some uh, interaction earlier and uh, I, I, I feel, I feel um, that I'm in, in a great place. So I'm a historian of Ukraine I've done quite a bit of work, particularly earlier in my uh, life, on uh, land holding in the old country. And I was raised by a woman 
who was a peasant in the old country, my grandmother. So I have direct personal and emotional attachments to this topic and scholarly um, work on it. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, and our last panelist is Otpem Soakiskin Wamagail, Matt Hilterman. Uh, he is a historian, uh, an interpreter, a cultural interpreter, uh, basically does a whole bunch of things. So he can kind of explain his many, many hats. <laughs> Uh, you should see my hat closet. It's it's actually a problem. There's got to be at least 50 in there. Um, yeah, so I was rehearsing doing the whole intro and mischief and then uh, you made the hat joke and now I'm just <laughs> off kilter. But uh, my name is Matt Hilchman. I'm the uh, historian from Métis Nation, Alberta Region 3. Uh, I've been working in uh, various aspects of the museum and heritage industry for the last uh, 13 years, I think. I don't know, it's been a while. Started in 2008, you can do the math. Uh, but in addition to uh, historical research and um, um, public history, I've also uh, got a solid side hustle as a uh, weaver. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just someone who really likes learning and somehow made that into a job. Uh, but I'm really excited for tonight because one of the, the things that I'm really interested in, um, both academically and personally, is uh, Indigenous agriculture because it's something that I don't think gets the attention it deserves for reasons I'm sure we'll get into tonight, but I'm just really excited to be part of this. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to sort of pose the question uh, and, and have people respond. And I think um, some some of our panelists will have a presentation and others are just going to it'll be a bit more of a conversation. Um, we are also going to have uh, time for a Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, please go ahead and put them into the Q&A section um, at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of, uh, of everybody's uh, presentations, I'll, I'll choose some of those to, to pose to the panelists. So really what we're trying to do today is understand, um, you know, how, how did we get to this point? How, how did we get to where we are? So we, we wanna know also where we're gonna be in the future, right? And in order to do that, we need to understand the past. And one of the things that we decided to look at were land-based practices and relationships uh, in the Ukrainian homeland uh, before Ukrainian settlers came, and then land-based practices and relationships here before uh, settlers came. And we want to see, we want to tease out some of, of those practices and relationships, see if they're still existing, um, see what they looked like, see if things have changed, and maybe if some of those practices um, can be revitalized on these lands, that's a, that's a potential future-looking thing. So, um, it's it's totally up to the panelists as to who wants to talk first. Uh, I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna poke at you, but if somebody has a presentation that they'd like to get into, I think John Paul did. So maybe I'll suggest that John Paul goes first, if that's okay. Sure. Am I am I visible? Okay. So uh, let me start first with a little bit of of screen sharing. So this here, I don't know whether it's very clear, um, but this is the size of agricultural land holdings in uh, the old country. The Ukrainians came to Canada mainly from two regions of Ukraine, uh, Galicia and Bukovina. And um, I think I would like to get a better, yeah. Yes, I think this gives it better. Um, what I want to emphasize is how small were the holdings uh, from the old country. So most people, you know, half the holdings were up to two hectares. That's uh, five acres. Um, uh, and uh, only a small percentage were even 25 acres. And a very small percentage made it up to 50 acres. So the land was uh, the, the land was 
uh, very small by comparison to what we're used to here. And it was good soil, black earth, uh, good climatic conditions, a temperate climate like in Southern Ontario or Michigan. Uh, and, but nonetheless, there was, I'm having a problem with um, showing this. Um, the, the productivity of the land wasn't great. So in the Ukrainian territories, uh, from one hectare of land, you got less wheat, less rye, less barley, less oats than in, uh, let's say, the Austrian parts of the, uh, of the, of the monarchy. And, um, and I, I can't see the end of my uh, end of it, but if you looked, Denmark has even a, a better, better, better uh, 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 productivity. And the reason primarily was that there was very primitive peasant uh, agriculture. Uh, this is my great grandfather, you see him here, and he's got a, a, a rake that he's made himself out of wood. Actually, a great deal of the implements that were used were uh, made of wood. And at the time when Ukrainians were emigrating toward to Canada, they, uh, at that time, there was more introduction of metal tipped plows, um, uh, moving to plows from harrows. You know, there was, this was a time, the turn of the century, when, when agriculture was improving and the methods were. Ukrainians did not have primogeniture, which means that they didn't give the property to their oldest son. That would have been the case in many European cultures, like, like the Germans would, would, would give the uh, uh, father would give the land holding to his eldest son. And then all the younger brothers had to go elsewhere and strike out uh, for themselves. And that was why there's so many Germans all over in Ukraine, you know, all over the place because they emigrated searching for better paths. Same thing in Spain, all the Spanish Hidalgos, right? The ones who were disenfranchised at home, they went off to become conquistadores and things like that. In Ukraine, this was not the case. You divided the land uh, among the children. So there was a continual division of the land. It was divided among the children, male and female. Um, so that uh, what would happen as health improved, as, as um, um, they got a little bit more nutrition, as their lives improved, the population grew and the land just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That is what provokes this massive uh, emigration to the new world. It was possible if you had the money to buy land in Ukraine beginning in the 1870s, uh, you could buy it from uh, other peasants or you could buy it from uh, uh, a landlord's uh, manorial estate, which might be parceled and sold in pieces to the peasants. Uh, the pattern of land holding was way different than, our, uh, than what we're used to. We're used to big farms that, um, that are all together as one piece. In Ukraine, uh, people had, uh, one family might have only, you know, five acres, but uh, those five acres would not be in one piece. They might be in 10 or 15 pieces spread around. I'm going to go quickly share just for a second, even though I'm sort of unhappy with the way these things come out. But this is a map of a village, a detailed map of a village, uh, not far from, uh, well, near Yavoru, if you know where that is. But you see all these little parcels of land? All those are not individual, they're individual parcels, but you know, he could have a, you could have a parcel here, a parcel there, a parcel here, a parcel there, a parcel here, a parcel there. This was a way that they um, helped the crop to survive. So that if there was a hailstorm or anything like that, uh, they would have different crops in different places. They also 
you know, they knew the soil intimately. One of the things, my grandmother, for instance, uh, she didn't know very many places. She knew, you know, some places near where she grew up in the old country. She knew Scranton, Pennsylvania. She knew New York. She heard a place where people had gone. But she had, like all these peasants had, an intimate knowledge of the micro toponyms. So they would they would have a huge store of geographical knowledge on little teeny pieces of land and uh, intimate connection with it so that they would know exactly the best place to put their potatoes, the best place to put uh, millet or, or whatever they were, they were putting, potatoes they put in the garden actually. Um, so in this kind of pattern of land, land ownership had been established about 1500 and stayed in the territory uh, until also like the turn of the century, some people began doing what they called comasatia, which is massing the land together so that they have one piece. Um, but uh, most, most peasants continued to hold land in strips. They also had a garden, which would be near their house. So the houses would be like along the road and the fields would be, uh, and, the, and, and, and the garden would be right near the house. But the fields would be further afield um, and, and usually near a river because a lot of the grain during serfdom would be, uh, well, the manorial grain would be taken to the river and sold. Um, and there was land held in common as well. And those were pastures and woods. Um, Sometimes they were divided between the, uh, the peasants and the landlord, or sometimes the landlord held the common land and dished out the wood and, uh, and uh, so forth. And meadows were also uh, held in common by the peasants. To say a little bit about the livestock, almost every family had a cow. That was the main source of protein. The milk, the cheese from that cow was, was absolutely vital to the survival of the family. And if a cow died, it was, and usually they had one cow. If a cow died, that was a tragedy like we might imagine having your home blow up or something like that. My grandmother to her dying day remembered the cow dying in her, in her, in her home because that was a big crisis. Uh, pigs, uh, peasants kept a pig or two if they could afford it. Uh, sometimes they couldn't afford it, but uh, uh, local businessmen, mainly Jews, uh, would uh, bring, a, bring a, a, a small pig to the farmer and the farmer would feed it on scraps and then they would kill the pig later and, uh, and the farmer would get some and, uh, and the businessman would get would get the rest, you know, the rest of it. Um, they didn't eat a lot of those pigs. My grandmother told me that they killed a pig once a year, sold most of it, and that was their meat. So they had meat at Easter. And, and uh, they were poor peasants, and other peasants had more. Uh, they used draft animals to do their work, not machinery. So uh, traditionally, it would be oxen. But with the improvement of agriculture towards the 20th century, they uh, added horses. So there are more and more horses and fewer and fewer oxen as time goes by uh, into the 20th century. So I think that explains the, the basic layout and practices of these farmers before they ever came to Canada. So, I mean, it's they faced a totally different situation in Canada. I want to say also, as I said, these land holdings were, were uh, parceled out about 1500, but they had been farmed for millennia earlier. And so they weren't breaking the soil. They had no experience in breaking the soil. Uh, they normally lived in houses. Um, and so coming to Canada was going to be quite an experience for them. So that's 
that's how I'd like to, to I think I, I've covered what, what I need to cover. Wow. It's so interesting to hear this because, um, you know, I, I did, I personally learned a little bit about European history, um, farming practices and stuff, but very much from an English and French uh, point of view. And so seeing some of the differences here with the Ukrainian uh, ways of farming is interesting. And, and two, two of the things that really struck me as you were talking were what you were describing was such a very specific place-based knowledge. And that, that is something that Indigenous peoples also value very much, right? You can't just like, you can't take a group of people, I think, any, anywhere and just plop them somewhere completely different and expect them to thrive right away. There, there has to be that time to develop that relationship and that knowledge that you talk about, that specialized knowledge with the land. But the other thing that strikes me um, throughout your, descript your descriptions is the intense hierarchies that were in, in place. Um, you know, the, the, the really intense control over access to resources um, and just the dwindling, the dwindling land that was such an issue throughout all of Europe um, and that, the kind of pressure that that lends. And as, as much as we understand that history and everything, it's such a foreign concept over here. Um, you know, there, of course, there are different groups who, who you know, might, might uh, fight over resources and, and things like that, but there wasn't that, there wasn't that top-down um, oppression or hierarchy uh, or the same level of scarcity. So that's that's really, really interesting. Um, Let's uh, mm -hmm. say about scarcity. Mm -hmm. my, um, my grandmother came to my big family and uh, they didn't have enough food for everybody. And they chose a girl and didn't feed her. That's such an unthinkable decision to make. That's really horrible, yeah. But um, I'm sure it's not, it wasn't, you know, the only situation like that. That's, yeah. Um, I was hoping that uh, perhaps uh, Elder Francis, if you could give us some information on some uh, place-based practices, land-based practices uh, before colonization, anything you can share. I'm just going to share a little bit of, uh, thank you uh, again, Chelsea. I'm just going to... Uh, share a little bit about uh, growing up after leaving residential school and uh, thank you Jean Paul for some very useful information because it triggered a memory where uh, I took the risk to leave the reserve and uh, work for some local farmers that were uh, around Wellington area so this is where I really took that risk of leaving the reserve but I always loved the land and uh, I learned how to drive uh, machinery tractors uh, and did uh, some of the milking that was done and uh, the gardens that uh, we did. So uh, I learned how to farm actually. And uh, even today I love, uh, uh, I have a flower bed back in my little uh, place in uh, uh, Evergreen in Edmonton. So uh, it's, a, it's a community that grows a lot of flowers and uh, join the garden club and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, you know, it, it's good to have those memories because I remember picking roots, labor was really tough then. And uh, we worked, you know, but we got a lot of satisfaction being in connection with the earth. And I remember uh, picking rocks. Uh, in those days, if you can imagine the old combines that they use, a lot of stooking. I'm sure uh, Chief would understand that part of it. And, uh, you know, uh, the combines used to go right into the night. So I, I learned a lot. and. Uh, that's basically where I got my first uh, idea of getting out of the re reserve and, you know, hey, it's possible to work out here. But also that uh, Ukrainians and Native people around Saddle Lake area, Wellington, Vilna, Two Hills, really got along well because uh, we kind of shared similar, similar cultures. Now, what I wanted to share also was... Uh, you know, uh, today at the University of Alberta, where I kind of consult as a, an elder, a practicing elder, I've been invited to participate uh, in growing tobacco and uh, other traditional medicines. It's a place called uh, Indigenous Garden Prairie Urban Farm. And so this Saturday, we're going to learn how to uh, separate different tobacco plants and uh, how to uh, farm them and stuff like that. But in those, uh, uh, growing all these medicines, some of the things that I was asked to consult on was things that we use in ceremony, like uh, sage 
is very resilient. And uh, so we, we will not have to go back to the rest to gather sage areas that we know. Uh, things like uh, sweet grass, uh, things like mint, uh, which always grows around beaver houses. Uh, and I know that even nettles have a, 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 a value on how to treat, uh, like the prostate gland, for instance. And then uh, blueberries, different berries, uh, and, you know, uh, muskeg tea, Labrador tea, but uh, I, I've been uh, kind of researching and I need to research more on some of these medicines. Unfortunately, as a, as a kid, when I used to go with my grandmother and pick up medicines, I didn't really pay attention and I didn't really know how to identify or name specific plants because they had all three names like uh, uh, we guess, red root, and uh, uh, I eat us <laughs> of rock pants, but uh, they had all names that, uh, you know, uh, we take a squishier, wild onions, and that we use them in, a, in our mixture for duck soup in springtime and stuff like that. But yeah, we gathered all these medicines and uh, we, that's the relationship to the land. We knew where the medicines were and uh, cynic root, uh, cynic root was a, uh, uh, or mean cigars, as they call them. And we call them means as a berry, but they look like a strawberry. And so uh, identifying those kind of plants and what, what they were used for, because native people used to sell those uh, to the drugstores for, uh, for a certain amount of money, I guess, to pay for their livelihood. So uh, again, like uh, things like this sweet grass, I don't know if it's growable, I know some people have tried and I, and I think it's possible, but uh, I like to have more knowledge on, on how to process it. So uh, uh, one of the things I'd like to mention as uh, this tobacco, you recognize this Larissa and uh, Maria, there's tobacco in here and uh, the des design, but this here is also tobacco in here and uh, it's got the flower kind of design. We call this Lutureo Ateokan Wepanason. Uh, prayer cloth that's come from uh, the design. So I, I was looking at your design that you used that was produced. And of course, our designs are very representative of that, you know, the moccasin and again, the buffalo hide and all that. So uh, we have a lot of similarities and all of these things uh, really sit well with me. And uh, I'm really honored to be here today. And there's so much knowledge, I'm sure that other panelists will share. So I'll stop right there, but I just wanted to mention that. And uh, thank you once again. Manasko when I hi. Hi. Chief Desjardins, if you have some things you could share. Yeah, uh, hello everybody. I just wanna say uh, again, uh, pre-contact uh, to Buffalo. Um, what it meant and what it did for our people and uh, how we were uh, uh, resilient, but also self-sustaining people. We're able to live off the land, live in harmony with the animals and be thankful for the animals. I think that's one thing as First Nations people, we are thankful. Every day we're thankful. We put down our tobacco, you know, you take a life when you're out hunting, you, you smudge your weapon, would be your gun, your bullets, and, and, and you're going to be thankful that that animal can feed you for the winter. You know, I, I want to share, I would say, uh, 80 plus years ago, it'd be my father and his brothers and sisters, they, uh, they were in Wolf Lake, and uh, they were called uh, at that time, I would say, road allowance people. And they, uh, they lived in a ditch. But that family has taught me how to work. And uh, that's one thing that uh, our, our people are, are, are hard workers, just like everyone else. And uh, we're, we're able to uh, farm because that's what the government wanted us to do. Once they put us on reserves, they wanted us to be farmers. You know, but the sad part is we weren't able to sell our, our product because we weren't able to leave the reserve. You know, and um, that's probably 60 years ago that we were only allowed to leave the reserve with a permit. 
And uh, our people hunted, trapped. We had our own economy. We had our own economy, I would say, before, uh, say, something like Fish and Wildlife put all these regulations on us. We're able to hunt, trap, fish. That was part of our livelihood, to trade fish, to sell fish. Today, you sell a fish, you lose your boat, you lose your truck, you lose your net, you lose your gun. And sometimes some families only can afford one net. You know, and, and moving, moving along, you know, we are uh, hunters, we're gatherers. And right now, that's the moving right now in, in First Nations country. We are preparing for the winter. And we prepare the moose. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we use every part of it. The liver, the heart, the nose, the tongue. Where some people will say, ew, or whatever kind of remark they're going to say when we say the nose. But the reason why we use the nose in, in the, of that animal is, is, is the spirit of that animal. You always see a moose going forward. So us as First Nations people, we try and go forward as well like that animal. You know, we're, uh, we're gatherers. We pick our medicines. We, we plant our gardens now. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a livelihood that we have to uh, adapt and show our children and our grandchildren up until today. You know, so, you know, we're, we're able to, to gather medicines. You know, I talked to my mother today. She's going to be 80 September 24th, creator willing. And she's working on her medicines, you know, in her, in her life with my father, they're, uh, they're uh, I would say, uh, uh, ceremonial slash medicine elders, where, where industry and uh, the, the, the white, dominant white society would say uh, that's a weed. Uh, it could be somebody's cure for a cancer. You know, and uh, through the time with our siblings, our brothers, you know, we, we learn different things from our parents. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful for that teaching because, you know, uh, we're able to carry on these teachings, even what's happening today with this COVID. You know what, uh, there, there, are, there are medicines that we could take that would uh, help us survive. And, uh, you know, uh, we're preparing for the winter and, uh, you know, we're preparing our berries, you know, we're canning just like all of you. You know, we're freezing our meat. We got a little creative because we evolved. We take it to uh, the meat packers and you, you, you add pork or you add beef and you mix it up and you get more. And um, we have evolved so much as, as, as a people. And, uh, you know, uh, but it, it's important to have that balance, the balance of ceremony and the land. And uh, today, our people still ceremony. Today, our people still go without food and water. That's called fasting. You know, in, in, uh, in the Bible, it talks about the fasting that uh, the great one did, Jesus, right? So that's what we do. We're connected to the land that way. And I wanted to just to share that much. We have evolved so much, but we're preparing for the winter. And similar stories to our, our friend there and... Uh, in the Ukraine, you know, uh, another thing about the land, because we're talking about Kayasago, when you, when you get up in the plane, when you see how this land is divided, uh, and uh, us as First Nations were put on these reserves and we're, we're, put, we're put there, I, I, I don't know if it's uh, under uh, control or to make room for the settlers or to get us out of the way uh, of the railroad, you know, but when you go up in the plane, when you see how that land is divided, you know, just imagine, I wish our people had 160 acres, a quarter section each for their family, where they could uh, build a farm and, and, and plant canola or barley or oats and, or a cattle farm and sustain for their people, you know, not live on reserve 
under a system that's holding us down. You know, uh, today is a day where I get to share and uh, you know what, uh, just being real, I don't have notes. I am uh, just shooting from the hip and that's what I do. And I just want to share that much in, with each and every one of you. And, uh, you know, to, uh, to say that, uh, you know, uh, our elder talk about resiliency. You know, I, I heard stories of uh, our ancestors sleeping in teepees, sleeping on straw, with the old ladies making uh, blankets out of a hundred rabbits. Just try and understand and think about that. You know, our, our people were had their own economy prior to contact and prior to Indian Act and prior to uh, trying to, uh, you know, take the Indian out of the child, all those things that happened. But we today, we still farm, we still gather, we still hunt. We are kind, loving people. And what, and, and it's our ceremony. You know, I sun danced with white people. I fasted with white people. And uh, because the beauty of our, our ceremonies, they see it where one time they were outlawed. So I just wanted to share that much and I'll stop there and I thank you all for listening to me. Hey, hi. Um, I think that's it, it's so interesting too what you and Elder Francis have shared just about the, the great variety of activities that people use to support themselves and that self-sufficiency that was the norm before contact. People were able to support themselves completely. It might not have always been easy, but also that ability to adapt was really important. So you have people relying on the buffalo, but not just the buffalo, right? You had also, you had people doing uh, fishing, hunting other animals, big and small game, um, gathering medicines, gathering berries, and not just where things were. It's not, it's not like uh, Indigenous peoples just walked around wandering and lost. They knew where the places were. And in, and in gathering, when you talk about that respect and that connection to the land, there's always the teaching to not overgather. And not take too much because then there won't be there won't be enough next year, and so that that is also a tradition that is definitely continued that is part of the part of the teachings, and it's also a, a way to maintain that self sufficiency for so many future generations. So um, not overdoing it in any way um, seems to be a really really important teaching. Hi hi. Um, so Matt, uh, I'm really interested to hear about. Uh, any any farming information you can give us because so often you know we we hear about hunting the buffalo and fishing and things like that but there's this assumption made that indigenous peoples just didn't farm until it was introduced yeah and i actually really love the way chief desjardins uh ended his his bit because he said you know we were uh hunters and farmers and gatherers these things aren't mutually exclusive the way they've often been made out to be um, in fact, I think both him and Elder Francis touched on this, where uh, a lot of restrictions were placed on Indigenous farmers, particularly First Nations farmers during the reserve area or era, to actually limit agricultural productivity. Um, so like in the research I've done, I've found evidence of um, agriculture among, there was a, the earliest uh, Cree band I found uh, farming. They were called the magpies. Uh, I haven't been able to specifically locate them in, a, in an exact location, but uh, from what I can tell, they were in Treaty 4 territory, and they were harvesting uh, potatoes and corn by the 1830s. By the 1860s, there were about a dozen different bands of Cree who were actively engaged in agriculture. And what's interesting is that this undertaking uh, seems to have happened without any missionary it seems to have been largely transmitted uh, from other indigenous groups. So let's take a step back real quick and talk about the history of indigenous agriculture on the Northwestern Plains. Because the earliest evidence we have for farming, um, basically on the Canadian prairies, dates to about 1200 AD at Lockport, Manitoba. Um, and there, the, the settlement there was inhabited for a couple hundred years, abandoned in the mid-1300s, and then re-inhabited in the 1400s 
uh, from people, it, from what the archaeological record shows, they seem to have been uh, Suin people. Uh, James Daschuk, I think, argues that they're ancestral to the Nakoda. But uh, anyways, real interesting because you can actually trace them along the Capel Valley. And as they get, actually, I should bring up this map. <laughs> it was the one thing I wanted to share visually. Uh, yeah, so um, if you look in this area labeled three, that's your tall grass prairie slash Aspen Parkland. And as the, uh, the uh, people ancestral to the Nakoda move westwards along the Capel, they move from being farmers to buffalo hunters. But that area, um, label number three, the tall grass prairie Aspen Parkland, remained a, a haven for farmers from the eastern woodlands uh, basically until the 19th century. In fact, the first person we have documentary evidence of starting a farm in this area was uh, Chief Peguis of the, uh, the Red River Ojibwe. Uh, and that was 1792. Now, I bring all this up because there's this idea that, first of all, that farming is inherently European. And second, that indigenous peoples didn't farm, or if they did, they learned it from white people. And I really want to get at that because, like, that doesn't appear to have been the case. If you look at the spread of agriculture from Red River outward, um, pretty much all of the farmers we have documented before the arrival of the Selkirk settlers in 1812 were indigenous people. Um, they mainly grew corns, beans, and squash because that was the ecology and economy there, but also the mighty potato had been introduced. And the potato occupies an interesting role here because while technically brought to this part of Canada by the fur traders, it is a native uh, crop. It originates in Peru. And it, it is hardy as all get out. It'll grow anywhere. I once read an account of the, uh, the farms up at uh, Fort Good Hope in the Northwest Territories. They had like, I don't know, 18 bushels of wheat, uh, 12 carrots, six onions, and 100 barrels of potatoes. Potatoes will grow anywhere. Um, and that's an interesting facet of indigenous agriculture in the Northwestern Plains compared to later colonial agriculture, is that it was, it was very much mixed farming. So people didn't grow just one crop because let's be honest, growing just one crop in a field is a terrible idea. Monocropping, um, study after study shows that we shouldn't do it, but, uh, some people are, are tied to tradition. Also, I guess it's probably easier. But no, the, um, the farms we had, and they were often called gardens because they were smaller than European farms. Um, but they were highly productive. And uh, I wish I could find the source. I can't find the source today. <laughs> I was looking while uh, John Paul was talking, sorry. Um, but I remember reading a report from 1857. It was in the um, sessional papers of um, like the British Parliament with regards to Rupert's land. And it discussed how um, five acres at Red River could grow what 10 in Ontario and 20 in Europe could grow. And so we were farming those small plots of land like John Paul was describing, but we could get the equivalent of like a pretty large tract of land out of it. And because a lot of the, pro the crops we grew were uh, root vegetables like potatoes, they didn't actually require that much care. And that's really important when understanding how um, farming and hunting articulated. Because once you got your crops in the ground uh, and you got to bear in mind um, Red River over here, and then also the parkland belt that stretches across the Northwest. And uh, that includes settlements like Edmonton, Victoria, uh, Fort Saskatchewan, St. Albert, Duhamel, um, Batosh, et cetera, et cetera, I could go on. But because 
it was relatively, it wasn't broken soil, like John Paul was describing. Um, it retained a lot of natural nutrients. And like so much so that tilling that soil actually damaged uh, <laughs> the crops. You would get less of a yield if you tried to till it. Um, and that famously happened to Alexander Ross, I believe in the 1850s, uh, where he tried to have a model farm based on European standards. And he basically had to beg his neighbors to feed him because it was such an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> uh, but anyways, yeah. So because the, the soil was quite rich and a lot of, a lot of these farming places were on floodplains, um, meaning that the sediment from flooding could rejuvenate the soil annually, um, you didn't really need to till it or cultivate it in the summers. And so that left the people free to go on the annual buffalo hunts. And, um, you know, then you'd come back and you'd harvest the crops in fall. And then some people would start hunkering down for winter in the settlements, and some people would go back on the plains for a second hunt in the winter. But the, uh, the idea that hunting and farming were mutually exclusive, to my mind, is a very European notion because the crops we farmed and the way we cultivated them were specifically chosen in such a way and like we we did what worked so um we had a way of making farming and hunting and gathering articulate rather than them being mutually exclusive and now i am i'm speaking to this largely from the Métis perspective, but I want to point out there were a lot of uh, Cree, Soto, and uh, Iroquois. And yes, there are Iroquois in Western Canada. Um, Michelle Band, look it up in case, you, in case you haven't heard of them. But uh, Cree, Soto, Iroquois, Métis uh, in the North Saskatchewan country all sort of lived fairly similar lifestyles along these lines uh, to varying degrees of hunting, and farming and gathering, but all did a bit of each, which is, I think, a really interesting uh, discussion, mainly because we never hear about it. And I think the reason we never hear about it is rooted in the notion of the, the imaginary or the white man's Indian, uh, which defines indigeneity in opposition to how uh, white Canadians want to imagine themselves. Uh, that is to say, the imaginary Indian is based more on what is the opposite of whiteness as constructed by white people rather than actual indigenous people and their, their experience and knowledge, if that makes sense. And so in, in the, the frontier myth and the construction of the imaginary Indian, to be white is to be settled and farming. And so because indigenous peoples are constructed in opposition to that, were seen as nomadic and whatever else. And that's not to say we didn't travel, but it's also not the case that we uh, weren't capable of cultivating our land. And this is a really interesting thing when you get to the treaty era and the era of script, because people were really using their land uh, in a beneficial way before that. But with um, treaty, uh, you get these farming instructors who have a very narrow view of what agriculture should look like. And then after 1885, you have, um, because despite the narrow views of those farming instructors, a lot of indigenous farmers did quite well, too well for some of the white folks they neighbored, such that uh, um, white farmers began to lobby their MPs to put restrictions on reserve farming, forcing people to trade their threshing machines for uh, sides and hand flails. And of course, no one can be expected to succeed at farming when they've been downgraded like that. But the, the struggle of indigenous, like of First Nations to farm is very much rooted in government policy, not agricultural acumen. And for the Métis, it's, it's a little bit different, but it still comes down to government policy. S simply speaking, and I, I think uh, 
I forget who brought this up, but basically, wouldn't it be nice to have 160 acres, right? Well, like I'm going through this um, uh, review of Calgary land holdings right now. And I'm amazed at how many people, how many colonists are buying land in Calgary with script records they very much should not have. Um, and so because of the way script was administered, a lot of Métis who had previously been farmers ended up without a farm, which also makes farming difficult because it turns out you need land to farm. So I would say that the notion that Indigenous peoples were farmers uh, here on the Northwestern Plains, it, it occurs at the intersection of mythology and government policy. And uh, speaks more to, I guess, yeah, it's, we farmed just fine when we were allowed to. We were really good at it, in fact. But the problem is there's this mythos and uh, history of government policy that kind of kiboshed that, such that, you know, today we're viewed as simply, you know, hunter-gatherers without any acknowledgement of are, you know, the, the way we use land in an agricultural sense. Oh, I think that's most of my rant. I don't know. But <laughs> Very informative rant. <laughs> and I don't think so ranty as, as much as, uh, yeah, just sharing good information. I'm just um, trying to keep it under, under 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I could go on for that, uh, on about that brown. I, I think I think this whole conversation could go on for a really, really long time. And, and what strikes me about um, sort of what everybody has said is so whether we're talking about Ukrainians, um, you know, in various regions uh, before before coming over, whether we're talking about First Nations or Métis is people are resilient and innovative, but they can only do so much within the, the systems that they are enfolded within. Right. So if if you have um, land landowners uh, in the Ukraine who have most of the access to resources and perhaps control um, access to common lands and things like that you do what you can within that system and and here as well so things were going fine until they weren't and and the potential is there for things to be good again um, none none of what none of the, those divisions that chief Desjarlais was talking about when you're looking from from above none of those divisions, are set in stone. They haven't actually been here that long. The land doesn't need to be divided that way forever. So we can we can think about other ways to do it. Now, um, when you started speaking, Matt, uh, I apologize, Elder Francis, you had uh, raised your hand uh, with a comment. So I'd like to give you the floor right now. Thank you. I learned patience. <laughs> and the way, uh, you know, that's an interesting, uh, uh, just, this panel triggers a lot of thoughts when we're discussing. Uh, I'm not a politician, but uh, you know, uh, as Chief said, the government dictates just about everything. Uh, it can get really political, like our crown lands and our hunting rights and all that. All those laws have been really changed. A lot of our crown lands are into parklands now, and then they're sold to uh, settlers, you know, uh, people that are. Uh, are farming there. They change them into ranch lands. And I know this has been happening in, uh, you know, uh, living off the reserve and in the hunting areas that I used to frequent. But anyway, uh, uh, just to change the topic again, uh, like we say we're hunters, farmers, and gatherers. You often, heard, often hear the term Indian time. And people laugh because uh, they get the misconception that it's uh, it's uh, how late you are or one hour behind. But you know what? I want to correct people on that. Indian time really means about when it's time to harvest, for instance, when it's time to gather a certain type of berries, because all these berries, right from strawberries, like the crocus comes out first in springtime, and uh, the tulips, and then strawberries, uh, uh, Saskatoons, I believe, blueberries, raspberries, they all come at different times, just like the animals and, and even the times that they get together. And all our Cree moons are named after uh, uh, what's happening in that month. You know, it's very uh, root term language. And I, and I just wanted to mention that. And uh, I guess the other thing is, uh, 
when we talk about our culture and the real value of real native culture rather than the stereotypes that you see on the streets. When I was watching the video two, I think it was about two or three years ago with the Ukrainian dancers dancing with the uh, powwow fancy dancers, uh, the uh, fancy shawl dancers, the traditionalists, the grass dancers, you know, that was something really beautiful. It showed that similar similarity, but more than that, it really displayed the relationship of two nations. And, you know, I, I think that's really beautiful. And that's what life should be about. And, uh, you know, when you really think about it, those kind of uh, dances really uh, speak to me in how in, uh, in our culture, when we do uh, like to be a traditional dancer, I used to be a traditional dancer, to live a life of sobriety, to live a life free of drugs, free of alcohol. And that's what I advocate and mentor and uh, to build self-esteem and motivation to our youth today, those kind of healthy activities in, with a clean spirit. And so uh, I advocate that and the appreciation of life because some of those dances, believe it or not, when you see those fancy dancers and the beat of the drum, the beat of the drum motivates the spirit of the people. And I just wanted to mention that because even the, like the beat of the fiddle, for instance, and the uh, duck dance or square dance, the Red River Jig, you know, man, it takes a lot of uh, physical, good phys physical condition. You know, if they put the fancy dancers in the Olympics and, and to, be, to be in beat with the drum, even when the drum stops, Man, that's, uh, that's an art. So uh, this kind of translates into healthy mentality, healthy spirit, healthy physical, uh, and uh, healthy emotional, you know? And, and so I just wanted to mention that uh, in this panel to see the real native culture, not what you see with our broken spirits downtown. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left and there, there aren't many questions, but um, there is one that I thought John Paul, uh, you could answer. Elder Francis and Chief Desjardins have talked uh, a bit about spirituality and that spiritual connection to the land and some of the practices. Um, Myrna asks uh, if you could tell us something about the religious beliefs and practices associated with land among villagers um, in the Ukraine. Sure. Um, <clears throat> The, the Ukrainians who came over were either Greek Catholic or Orthodox. They would not work on their feast days or on Sundays. Of course, women would work because they would be feeding everybody. Um, but the men would not work and the women would not do their um, agricultural work. Uh, they used many feast days were associated with particular agricultural moments. Um, so uh, they, they'll bring out the fruit to bless around the time of the transfiguration in the fall. Uh, it, it, there are uh, uh, rites that um, um, there are fast fast periods, of course. I mean, Myrna knows this. There are, uh, uh, fast periods where uh, you, you abstain from uh, um, meat and, and, and uh, dairy products. And, uh, and uh, the more observant would even do on one's, every Wednesday and Friday. But, but there were quite, quite a few of, uh, of customs. I, being myself not a farmer in the old country, I don't know them all, but you know, they marked, they didn't mark the time, you know, in, in the, the they were less involved in calendar time. Uh, for them, the, the major uh, divisions of time were the feast days. So all the kind of agricultural things were linked with the feast days. And there would be blessings of crops and uh, blessings of harvests. And, uh, you know, it was a traditional society. Now, now people do these things just to imitate the old ways. But um, the ones that was the way you lived. Interesting. Um, thank you for that. Um, 
so Elder Francis had always also mentioned uh, that in Cree, the, the names of the of the moons, so the, the months, right? So originally wouldn't have been a solar calendar, um, but rather a lunar calendar. And the names of the months describe important events, usually land-based uh, of, of the time. So for example, uh, there's, you know, there's the molting moon, there's the redding moon, uh, there's, you know, when, when animals are doing certain things. And um, Chief uh, Desjardins, you spoke about your connection to ceremony as well. And I was hoping you could actually share with us um, a, a bit about the timing, because, you know, I, I keep forgetting, I'm familiar with a lot of these things, but a lot of people watching aren't. So, you know, when you think about ceremony and, and when ceremony happens, what does, what does the, the land have to do with that timing? Yeah, um, I just want to say, uh, you know, when we prepare for maybe uh, the Big Lodge, the Sundance, what happens in exactly that, what Elder talked about, the moons, we, we watch the moons prior to having our, our, our singing and feasting, and in, in, in the, they have to touch every season. That's the way I was taught, not wait till January and rush it in. You start in the, you start in the, in the fall here, and, and then the winter when it snows, and then the spring, and then the summer, and you wait for the leaves finally for the big lodge, and that's how, you know, us as First Nations people, we uh, we use the different months, the elements, and uh, you know we uh, also use the constellations. You know, and um, it's not just the Big Dipper. You know, it, it has meaning to us. Um, you know, uh, John Paul talked about uh, acting. Acting like, they, like they're doing uh, how it used to be. I guess that, that's something about the evolving as a human being. Sometimes we see something, so we copy and then we change things. We shouldn't be changing things in our ceremony, our rituals. If, if it's First Nations or Ukrainian or, or our brothers, um, the, 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 the Indians or the Chinese, we all have our own tree. We all have our own way. But one thing I wanted to add um, is for uh, the, 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 the ceremony is feasting. When we feast, say Thanksgiving, say uh, Christmas, or uh, just having a feast, we, we lay out a spiritual plate before anybody eats. We feed our loved ones that went before us because we are all spirit prior to, to being an embryo and being born and then returning to when we pass to spirit. You know, so I just wanted to share that uh, to everybody that's listening. We take that very serious. That's one of the highest ceremonies that we have as well, is feasting. We have dreams of our loved ones that are, they come to us, they're dusty, they're hungry. They tell us when they want to eat. And, um, you know, and, 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 and we even lay out cigarettes for those who used to enjoy a nice cigarette and a cup of tea. You know, we tend to forget our loved ones, but we shouldn't. They, they help us from that side. When, we're, when you're feeling down as a human, pray to them to understand that element in that spirituality and the speed that they travel. They love it when we talk about them. You know, so our, our ceremonies, they're, they're, they're mostly done in the summertime as First Nations people. They're very beautiful, and um, I want to uh, um, invite, you know, invite uh, anybody who's listening uh, to reach out. Uh, we have sweat ceremonies, and, and that's uh, the rebirthing of our of, the, of our humanness, our spirituality, our, our our mental state, our body, and uh, we cleanse that way. Uh, and uh, our ways are, are not savage ways. That's what was given to us by the creator, that higher power. He give that to us as First Nations people. And, uh, you know, uh, 
the elements that we use, the medicines that can cure what the Western can't. You know, so I, I just wanted to share that, to, to share that, uh, you know, uh, to, to coexist amongst each other as human beings is important. To live off the land, you know, uh, homelessness and, and people needing a meal, it, it touches all races. You know, and uh, we, we have to pull each other along, regardless of our nationality. You know, share that love and kindness, break bread with each other. And, uh, you know, uh, this world would be a better place. You know, but it has evolved so much. We're, 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 we're buying water now. And we're, we're, we're worried about our, 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 uh, environment you know and I, I know i'm going a little off but i wanted to share we think about our polar caps and we think about uh, the carbon in the air and the emissions and uh, what are we going to leave for our grandchildren and the yet the ones that are yet to come you know we're all treaty people like what was shared earlier we were all the unborn at one time the signing a treaty we were all the unborn Somebody thought about us. Now we need to think about the unborn once again. And what are we going to leave them? What are we going to leave them? And what kind of state are we going to leave Mother Earth in? You know, as she's crying, crying out to us. You know, I just wanted to share that with before we go. And I want to thank everybody for listening to us. We don't claim to know it all. I know there's other teachings that we might, we may have forgot about, but we're all unique in our own way and we all have teachings that can help one another along our journey. You know, we're, we're, we're only in these borrowed lives in these bodies for, for a short time, you know, so we have to coexist and be kind and loving and sharing to one another. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we don't have a lot more time, but I just wanted to draw attention to some of the fantastic information that people have been sharing in the comments. Um, so, okay, one of the questions that we're unfortunately not really going to get time to get to was about Indigenous fire practices, burning practices um, that are going on in BC right now. There was a question about whether they were practiced here on the plains. I can tell you that, yes, they were. Uh, more information, I can't, I can't follow up with that right now, but yes, um, uh, you know, you, you can definitely find more information about that because Indigenous peoples have been speaking about this, about some of the, the, the you know, we have a forest fire season now and that, and that wasn't always the case. Um, some of the other things I've just learned a thing, I keep saying the Ukraine because that's how I was raised to say it. Uh, I've just learned that you should just say Ukraine, you know, just like you don't say the Inuit. <laughs> okay, so that's cool. Um, somebody else had a question about the kokum scarf. So the, the floral scarf that you see a lot of um, Indigenous women and Two-Spirit people uh, wearing uh, obviously did uh, was, was influenced very much uh, by Ukrainian uh, patterns and is such an integral part of uh, Indigenous fashion these days. So that, that itself could be an entire conversation. People were sharing information about their own relations uh, stories that they heard about their First Nations uh, ancestors picking rocks and doing that farming, hiring out when Elder Francis was talking about that, how it sparked a memory, other people's memories were sparked. Um, and a lot of information from some of the Ukrainian participants here about the fact that the, the months in Ukrainian are also named after uh, important events uh, similar to Cree. Um, some of, you know, the fasting that is shared, the reverence for nature, all of these kinds of things, there's so many similarities, um, you know, and, and whether, whether or not uh, we, can, we can capture those again today uh, is really up to the choice of individual people. So, all of you who shared information, I know I could listen to you for hours and hours more. I feel like this time has flown by. I'm, I'm a bit sad about it, actually. Um, but before we leave, I wanted to turn it back over to uh, Mirena, who is going to talk a little bit about the next event. So hi, hi, very much for everything that was said today. Thank you very much, Chelsea.
Thank you very much, everyone. I, I also didn't notice how an hour and a half passed. It, it was it felt as if we were just sitting in a circle and, and talking. And the chat was going also wonderfully. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation. I, I would just like to say that our next event, um, I will try to say it in Cree. Sorry if <laughs> I make mistakes. Otakusik Mina Anok, Chora Isihodni, yesterday and today on these lands, will take place on October 20th at 5 p.m. Uh, you can register now. It's on storiesofthieslands.ca. Please uh, go, uh, come back, uh, and let's continue this conversation. Thank you very much, and have a good night.